I was delighted to be asked uh, to do this. I want to say pay my debts first of all to Helen and to the late Vincent Bryan, Vincent Ryan in Dora National School who was, Vincent Ryan was a brilliant history teacher. He was a primary school teacher, but he was a brilliant history teacher who loved history, brought us around Dora Parish, explained an awful lot about the place. And in Tullamore CBS or Clash to Cullum as it is now, uh, Rory Masterson is also a, a, a fantastic history teacher. And without history teachers, without people working in voluntary organisations, history gets lost. And it's history isn't something that resides in the university alone. Uh, there are a lot of people who work at history and I was exceptionally fortunate in both Vincent Ryan and in, in, in Rory Masterson. I'm not quite sure they were fortunate to teach me, but um, I was fortunate to have them. I want to talk a little bit about history and I'm going to talk a little bit first, and then I'm going to talk about a lot about the GAA and about sport more broadly when it comes to history and how people think about history. And I'm interested in history as something that's told in the present. History is not the past. History is the story that we tell ourselves of the past. Um, it is set in the past, but it is a story from the present. It reveals truth about the present and about how we think, and it helps, helps us to make sense of the world around us. And when it comes down to it, I'm interested in history because of the present rather than the past as such, which sounds like a contradiction, but that's the way I am. And I understand that there are people who are interested in the past just for the sake of the past, but that's not how I, how I come at it. Um, that's the first point. The second point of it is, the point of doing this is that something is something is happening in the world at the moment around language, around facts, and around arguments. And in short, what there is, is there's a sustained assault underway on the importance of, of language and of facts. And partly this is a thing about propaganda. And we know that there's nothing new in propaganda. You can go back to the Roman world and the Greek world and there is evidence of people using propaganda. And what's different now, though, is the manner in which, through the portals we carry around in our pockets, how there is a global reach from one person, from one portal, which can go to millions and then hundreds of millions of spots. Um, and it is a simple fact that on a planet of 8 billion people, there are more than 5 billion people now on social media in some shape or form, which gives you a reach which is incredible. And it means that the old wine of invention and of Spain is rebottled and redistributed day after day for free on social media and in traditional media also. And the rise of the smartphone since 2010 has greatly uh, exacerbated everything that has happened around this. And we know this from everything from Boris Johnson to Trump and Putin and the new politics that they have introduced where truth is increasingly irrelevant. Um, for example, this will not come as a shock to you, but the study of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign revealed that 78% of his factual claims were actually unfactual. They were lies. Um, but of course he won. And in his head, he also won in 2020 because reality and complexity pale beside a fictional world where all people, but where what people want to hear is more important than what really is. And that comes down to the brilliant American historian, Timothy Snyder, Snyder, who wrote, if you believe nothing is true, then everything is spectacle and the biggest wallet pays for the most blinding lights. That is to say, you buy the money, you buy truth and you spread it which is the last point I want to make about studying history before I move on. The skills you get from reading and studying history are really useful. They're a useful way of looking at studying the past in itself, but they're really important because they give you skills of critical analysis based on evidence. And most of all, what I will try and argue is that history is different because it is based on evidence. It is the way things are, not the way you wish them to be. And in general, I know there's people going to fundamentally disagree with what I have to say this evening about the GAA, but um, that's fine. I believe in argument. I live in a university where dissent is to be encouraged. I like having a row. And most of all, though, it has to be based on the fair usage of, of facts. Um, sport. 
the capacity for the invention of history is revealed time and again in sport. It can be found, for example, in the fact that the Rugby World Cup that has just been played for is named after William Webb Ellis, who is supposed to have invented rugby by catching the ball in rugby school in 1823 for the first time and running through a crowd of 150 other boys, thereby inventing a new game. I'm not going to go into the full details of how much nonsense that is, except to say that the story was invented after William Webb Ellis died. Um, and it's a product of class warfare in England. I'll answer more about that later if anyone wants to talk about it. And in Ireland, it is nationalism, not class, which has driven the inventions of history, or most of the inventions of history. It is, for example, Irish nationalists who invented the story that the inv Irish invented chess, with the 32 pieces of the Irish chess set or the world chess set supposedly modelled on each of the 32 counties of Ireland. Um, this is supposed to have happened sometime uh, about three millennia ago um, before any county had been invented, but we won't go into the details on that. Better said, better, better than that, it was said that when the Greeks invented the Olympic Games, they used for their inspiration the Talchon Games which had been held for centuries around the hill of Tara. Um, I won't go into that either, but that's just not true. Um, but these inventions were the product of the 19th century when Irish nationalists were trying to combat the power and prestige of the British Empire. These were not stupid people. They were trying to say, we have an ancient civilization too. We have our own power. We have our own past. Here it is. It is not, you may have wealth and the economy, but we have scholarship and we have antiquity. Um, but myth-making in nationalism, I'm, not, I'm going to focus on the revolution to show how this worked. And I'm going to start with Hill 16, the main terrace in Croke Park in Dublin, which was opened in October 1915, having been built from the rubble of the 1916 Rising. Um, this, this, as you can imagine, was not a straightforward task. Collecting the rubble from the GPO on O'Connell Street and dragging it up carts up Summer Hill and into Croke Park was not easy. More challenging still was reversing Times Arrow and organising for the rubble from the rising to be generated six months early to allow the new terrace to be called Hill 16 after the great iconic moment of, of Irish republicanism. That was a serious logistical challenge. But this is a story, the story of how this happened, is a story where anything is possible, where something can be made true if you wish it to be true. And it's basically a story which reduces history to, re to rubble and rebuilds it as myth. How did it happen? Well, the GA bought a ground at Jones's Road in December 1913, and they named it Croke Memorial Park, Croke being Archbishop. Thomas Croke of Cashel, the first patron of the GA after its establishment in 1884. He was the most nationalist of the Irish bishops in the late 19th century. For example, after the GA was established, Croke decided, described uh, cricket and tennis as effeminate follies played by degenerate dandies. He was also the man who described uh, Charles Stuart Parnell after his adulterous affair with Catherine O'Shea was announced as being, he's called Parnell, the measly runt who infected the litter. Um, and he was ultimately a man whose support for the GEA from its inception in 1884 was absolutely invaluable to its early prosperity. Um, so after the GEA bought Jones's Road, soon to be named Croke Park, in 1913, they set about redeveloping the whole stadium. And for example, at the 1915 GA annual convention, the Great War had already started, the Association Secretary, Luke O'Toole, was able to report that the wall at the railway end had been built, as in the wall that would be the back of Hill 16. He then said the enclosure on the side of the pitch facing Jones's Road was almost uh, complete. That would be the Hogan. And as well as that, the banking behind the goals had also been finished. In other words, Hill 16 was just done. Um, the completion of this enclosure extending from behind the goals towards what is now the Cusick stand, that is between what is now the Nally and the Cusick, the, the footprint of Hill 16, was confirmed in October 1915 
and the terrace was used for that year's All-Ireland Football and Hurling Finals. This is where it gets kind of complicated, but the Great War was already in progress. And stories of the involvement of Irish soldiers all over the Irish newspapers were central to popular discourse on the island at that stage. More precisely, just as the GEA was finishing the embankment behind the railway end goal, Irish soldiers were engaged in a ferocious battle in Gallipoli. Um, so ferocious was it that it was said at the time that the army of Gallipoli may as well be regarded as an Irish army, so many were the Irish people who fought there. A key focus of the campaign was a battle for right beside Suvla Bay, which those of you who remember the Pogues will recognise that from, from a song there. And the hill that they were fighting for was called Hill 60, 6-0. Six um, it was emblazoned on the newspapers, the battle for Hill 60. It's all over the Freeman's Journal, the Irish Independent and the Dublin Evening Press, the Dublin Evening Gazette from those years. And it appears that the redeveloped corner of Croke Park was considered by some to resemble the description of Hill 60, so the corner of the ground in Croke Park was called Hill 60 after the Battle of the War at Suvla Bay. There was a, a precedence for this, of course, already, the naming of grounds after the hills in wars. Those of you who suffered the disease of following Liverpool will know that the cop is short for spying cop, which again is um, essential. Um, it, the spying cop, which is there to uh, describe the terrace. It was, uh, the spying cop was far for in the Boer War. So that name was adopted for use when Anfield was opened. And so it was in Hillsborough as well, where the cop was also the name of the ground. Either ways, Hill 60 was duly named so in 1915. And this name prospered during the 1916 Rising, the War of Independence, Bloody Sunday, and on into the 20s. There's a newspaper report which describes what the atmosphere on Hill 60 was like on the day that Kevin Barry was executed in October 1920. All the way through the 1920s, you can see this in papers such as the Irish Independent in September uh, 1925, which reported on an All-Ireland final to say it was a living mountain of human faces. And it is not just the Dublin newspapers who refer to it as Hill 60, it is also the case for local papers such as the Munster Express, the Connacht Tribune, and so on around the country. Um, despite the widespread usage of the name, or maybe because of it, the name Hill 60 became a matter of disquiet for members of the Gaelic Athletic Association. It's reasonable to suggest that this disquiet was prevalent at the end of the 1920s, but either ways, in September 1931, Dan McCarthy, a former president of the GEA, then chairman of the Munster Council, who had also been a member of the IRA who had fought in the War of Independence, said that he took exception to the use of the name Hill 60. He said at the Central Council meeting that Croke Park was sacred ground sanctified by the blood of martyrs. He was talking, obviously, of Bloody Sunday. He said that the hill had been built from the debris of 1916 and he was sure that some of the men who gave their lives for Ireland were on that hill beforehand. So the fight for Irish freedom, he said, should be commemorated. Not, he said, one that took place in a foreign country fought by a foreign army. In response to McCarthy's words at the same meeting, the secretary of the GA, Luke O'Toole, told the meeting that he was now writing to various newspapers around the city about the matter. And it was agreed by the meeting that every time Hill 60 was appeared in the papers, O'Toole would write to them to express his disapproval. And finally, it wasn't just that they would write and say that. According to, according to the minutes, McCarthy said that the association should now officially designate the terrace as Hill 16. But if they could not do that, they should find some other appropriate title and get rid of Hill 60. Um, now, Dan McCarthy had been centrally involved in the GA for more than 30 years. Any sensible reading of the evidence leads to the conclusion that he knew full well that the terrace had not been built from the rubble of the 1916 Rising. This, that same conclusion must extend to everyone else who attended that meeting in September 1931. Nonetheless, the meeting duly agreed that the terrace should be renamed Hill 16 and the myth of the rubble began to spread from that committee room outwards. From then on, all the way through the 1930s, in advertisements paid for by the GEA, in tickets printed by the association, and in reports written by GEA sympathetic journalists, Hill 60 was called Hill 16. The pressure on newspapers was relentless and, and 
only once does it seem that the Irish press, judging by the searches that have done, published Hill 60. They made a mistake as late as 1935 and Julie corrected it the following day and said, we're sorry, we meant to say Hill 16. There was a mistake in the Connacht Tribune in 1938. Galway beat Mead in the 1938 All-Ireland football final uh, with Jimmy Tull Dunn as the star player and they put in this beautiful photographic assemblage of it but they made a mistake. They called it Hill 60 on the bottom of it and Julie received a letter um, from the GA and that letter and that article is the last time I can see the name of Hill 60 in the newspaper from the searches I've done. It may very well have slipped in afterwards, but I can't find it. Um, and then there is a letter from two Mead men. Always, there's always Mead men in the story somewhere. But in August uh, 1939, two Gales wrote to the editor of the Mead Chronicle um, urging Mead to victory in the 1939 final. The letter noted by way of inspiring their players that they should turn and face Hill 16 before the game in respect to Ireland's fallen heroes whose blood stained the debris of that immortal hill. In other words, the name and the myth had taken popular hold by the end of the 1930s. All truth had been demolished by the fact of the myth, of the nationalist myth. And the story basically had now taken hold. It was repeated time and again after, 19, after 1939. Best of all of this is a living witness who emerged through the thick smoke of a Dublin pub. A man who not only knew for a fact that it had indeed all actually happened, but he had actually helped to make it happen. So what do I mean by this? Many of you will have read the books and articles by the journalist Raymond Smith, who published for many years in everything, the Sunday Independent and onwards. He was an iconic figure in, in the history of Irish journalism. He was writing his weekly column in January 1966, the 50th anniversary of the year of the rising. And in the middle of writing his column, he went out um, to the Oval Pub, which I'm sure some of you know, on Middle Abbey Street, uh, for a couple of pints in the days when journalists were allowed to do that in the middle of writing articles. And as he drank his pint before he went back in to finish, he met this old Dubliner in the pub. And the Dubliner told him that he had been paid six pence a load for transporting the rubble from the GPO in O'Connell Street up to Croke Park. And the basic point of this, and Smith put this into the paper. What's the basic point? The basic point is that history was overwhelmed by the power of men in pubs telling stories. So, so much for the detail of that overpowering. It happened. What, what we have to ask is why it happened. So the myth of 1916, the myth of the hill, of, sorry, of Hill 16, was all of a piece with a decisive repositioning of the GEA's nationalist orientation in the years after the establishment of the Irish Free State. In its language and in its actions, the GEA adopted a nationalist position that demolished any sense of complexity or contradiction. You take its attitude to the men who fought in the Great War, for example, who were GEA members. The anonymous author of 60 Glorious Years, The Authentic Story of the GEA, which was published in 1946, claimed, efforts were indeed made to recruit GEA men for the British Army, and a special appeal was made to the hurlers and footballers of Munster, but there was no response. This was untrue. Indeed, there were so many GEA men joining the British Army at the beginning of the war that PJ Meehan, a leash, T, a leash MP, told the House of Commons in 1915 that the majority of reservists and recruits who joined up had been members of the association. Now, that's obviously the characteristic overstatement of a politician trying to make a political point, but it should not disguise the essential truth that the widespread enlistment of GEA men in the British Army was a reality. Um, now, there are infinite complexities in the relationship between sport and politics and sport and national identity. And it is actually in the complexities rather than any sort of cartoon history that you can understand stories such as that of James Rossiter. In the late autumn of 1915, Wexford defeated Kerry to win the All-Ireland Senior Football Final. In winning this match, that was the first of their four in a row. They were the first team ever to do a four in a row, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, and were an amazing, outstanding team who, until I suppose this millennium, 
their record had never been been beaten. But in beating Kerry in 1915, they avenged the defeat to Kerry in the previous year's final. A defeat which had been sustained despite the efforts of one of their best players, James Rossiter. Rossiter had actually scored the goal that won Wexford the Leinster final, played brilliantly in the final, but to no avail. Um, the thing is that by the time the 1915 final was played, Rossiter was dead. He had enlisted in the British Army and had died in his wounds, of his wounds, in France 10 days before the 15, 1915 All-Ireland Final was played. Um, that same autumn of 1915, Leeks, this is really hard to say, Leeks won the All-Ireland Hurling Championship. Um, in, in, the weeks, in the weeks after that game, uh, two Leech players um, enlisted and subsequently fought in the British Army in the Great War. The extent to which GEA members went to fight for the British Army has been researched by people such as Donald McAllen, Donald McAllen. And what they show is that basically there were more GEA men in the trenches in France than there were in the GPO in 1916. These are inconvenient truths to a constructed history, but they are the truth nonetheless. And they came from every corner. There were teams in Clare and on the Falls Road in Belfast who could not field because of the number of their members who were gone, uh, gone to France. Um, attitudes, though, of GEA officials to members of the association joining the British Army were more complex. The rhetoric of most officials was trenchantly against recruitment to the British Army. In July 1915, for example, the Honorary Secretary of the Galway County Board, Board Stephen Jordan, was charged with making statements which were prejudicial to recruiting. In Wexford, members of the GEA, led by the Wexford County Board member Sean O'Kennedy, called for some form of organised resistance amongst GEA members in the county towards against recruitment. Um, against that, there were others who had opposing views, and there were reports of a, a GEA meeting in Westmeath held under the auspices of the GEA, led by officials who tried to raise money for wounded soldiers who were home from the front who were GEA members. This complexity, though, of officials on either side and of the number of members who fought for the British Army was swept away in independent Ireland as the GEA sought for itself an impeccable nationalist pedigree. And not alone did this mean that none of its members could be admitted as having fought in the British Army, so too was it now claimed that all or almost all of those who fought in 1916 were actually GEA men. So not in the British Army, all in the GPO. Such claims were rehashed time and time again at GEA meetings. 1916, it was said, after independence, was something that the GEA was intimately involved in, supportive of, and had suffered for. L lending the claims a certain retrospective potency was Bloody Sunday, the 21st of November 1920, when Crown forces stormed into Croke Park, firing guns indiscriminately, even as they crossed the bridge on Jones's Road, shooting kids out of trees. On the way in, they killed 13 players and spectators, all told. One player and the rest spectators. There is no doubt, but even before that though, that the nationalist aspect of the GEA had hardened in 1918 and 1919. It identified with republicanism in ways that had never previously happened, but it was Bloody Sunday, 1920, that was later presented as the prism through which the GEA's putative republicanism should be viewed. In independent Ireland, of course, it was something that could be thrown at soccer. I'll give you an example. Down in Waterford in 1931, in the midst of a dispute between the GA and soccer, the chairman of the Waterford GA of the county board, Willie Walsh, turned and sneered at people who were involved in rugby, soccer and hockey and asked where they were on Bloody Sunday. He said the Black and Tans had not gone to Dalymount Park or Lansdowne Road to look for rebels. Instead, he said it was at Croke Park where they performed deeds which shocked the civilised world. They knew friend from foe and it was an unfailing experience. He said the Tans did not run into the men like the directors and players of Walford Soccer Club in Croke Park. In other words, there was a gradations, of, gradations of Irishness which could be seen. Croke Park, Daly Mount uh, and Lansdowne. Walsh had others beside him in the GEA hierarchy who were equally, equally vitriolic. Now, I don't write this or say this to mock or to sneer or to insult these men. They believed in the GEA. 
They believed in the GAA's cultural mission and they believe it was their mission to render the Irish Revolution meaningful in a cultural sense. They had not just fought a revolution so that the paint boxes could be painted green. They had fought for meaningful cultural revolution. They were committed through their own constitution of the GEA to work for a united Gaelicised Ireland. Ultimately though, I think we have to agree that they believed too much. Their belief drew them to write and to say things that were untrue. And the new history which they constructed of Ireland and of the GEA was used to promote the association and to undermine their opposition. This involved a reputed claim, a repeated claim that the GEA owed its success, as Harry Boland put it, to its undying commitment to drawing a line between the garrison and the gale. In pursuit of that, all inconvenient truths were buried and abandoned in making a new myth. This extended retrospectively even to the establishment of the GEA and its earliest years. The fact that before founding the GEA, Michael Cusick had founded a rugby club and affiliated it to the Irish Rugby Football Union was forgotten, abandoned. So too was Michael Cusick's call in 1882 for the establishment of cricket clubs in every parish in Ireland. He said cricket was a game that he loved. He had played it for many years at that stage and he believed it was one of the best ways to instil in boys good temper and stoicism under pressure. He said it was a game that should be played, as I say, in every parish in Ireland. Now it should be said that even though there was a step change after 1921 in how the GEA constructed its own past by emphasising its nationalist aspect, this was actually a process which Cusick himself had begun as early as 1899 and 1902, when he, he himself had denied any involvement in cricket and in rugby and repainted himself as a man of the west of Ireland, unsullied by any stains of Britishness. Why did he do that? Well, he wrote those words in 1899 and 1992 and 1902 to try and ingratiate himself or impress a new generation of Irish nationalists who were rising in the post-Boer War years. For example, the influential journalist PJ Devlin, writing a history of the GEA in Irish Freedom newspaper in 1911, subsequently repeated all of these statements of Cusick. Devlin said of Cusick, he disdained and distrusted all things English. Now, that's the project, that's what somebody said after he died, but when you go back and read his life story, it is true he founded the GEA, it is true he was involved in an Irish language organisation, but before that, he loved cricket and rugby, and they're simple facts. The notion, by the way, of Cusick being like this was taken on by T.F. O'Sullivan, who wrote the first history of the GEA, which is you can find online, if anybody wants it, in the Limerick County Library, the full thing there. It's a brilliant book. Uh, it's published in book form. O'Sullivan said that the GEA had helped not only to develop Irish bone and muscle, but to foster a spirit of earnest nationality and to save thousands of young Irish men from becoming mere West Britons. He said as well, Sullivan was kind of one of those officials who was zealous in their belief of the transformative power of the GEA. And they saw themselves engaged, not in a sporting organization, but in a project of, of, of national liberation. In this language, um, they were virulently anti-British. Soccer players were derided as being orange Catholics and always, always West British. The games that they played were condemned as being British and by extension Protestant. And it is from this that that slur, Pell Luther, was, was, uh, was derived. The fact that soccer supporters fought each other on the terraces and that they did not allow their games to be played on Sundays and that they paid their players were seen as evidence of their alien nature as against the Irishness of, of the GEA, which was supposed to be pure. Um, and the difficulty, however, was that the majority of the membership of the GEA didn't see the GEA like that. They saw it in other terms. They didn't really have display much interest very often in the cultural revival. Their membership of the GEA was ultimately focused on playing Gaelic football and on playing hurling. The adoption of a radical national position by the leadership could never be translated into action across the broad membership of an association where winning and watching matches was what inspired the most. And even within the leadership itself, the demands of running a thriving organisation from 19, about 1910 onwards saw officials consumed with arranging fixtures, 
appointing referees, booking trains, responding to appeals and objections. Uh, there, it seems to be the case that there was nearly no match played before about 1957, which didn't lead to an objection or an appeal uh, from somebody. Um, there was also managing finances, paying expenses and all the other issues that arise whenever people try to do anything together in any walk of life. Um, so what happened in the 30s with this history that was now constructed? The establishment of the Irish Free State saw the GEA trade on its history even as it invented it. A great example is the debate over the payment of an entertainment tax in the 1920s and 1930s. When firstly they come in the Nail government and and then they tried it twice, tried to impose a tax on income generated by sports bodies. The GEA lobbied successfully for exclusion from that tax. They cited time and again the nationalist credentials of the GEA. More than that, though, the GEA argued that because of its national service and its national service alone, it was the only sporting body which should be excluded from paying the entertainment tax. So it was not enough that it should be excluded and exempted, it also insisted that the others should pay. Um, which is fine for the GAA to make that argument. The GAA is entitled to make that argument. What is interesting though is that the government accepted that argument. And yet if you look back to the previous attempt by a government of Ireland to introduce an entertainment tax and sporting organisations, it happened in the second half of 1916, just after the 1916 rising. In response to the decision of the Irish government of the day, which of course was a British government ruling Ireland and was placed in Westminster, the Central Council of the GAA sent a deputation to Westminster in an attempt to secure exclusion. That same autumn of 1916, Another delegation was sent to meet General Sir John Maxwell to try to arrange the provision of special trains to GAA matches. Maxwell was the British commander, as you'll know, who signed off on the execution of the rebels after the 1916 Rising, but that's who the GAA went to meet. It speaks volumes for the priorities of the GAA that it should attend a meeting with Maxwell. It speaks volumes that they should go to Westminster to meet the British government to look for exclusion from tax. And it is also worth noting in passing that immediately after the rising, when the official commission of inquiry into the rising was told by Sir Matthew Nathan, Chief Secretary, and by the Chief Constable of the Royal Irish Constabulary, that the GEA had been an instigating factor in the rising, uh, the GEA uh, response was to flat out deny any involvement at all. It issued a statement saying that all allegations that the GEA had been used in furtherance of the objectives of the Irish volunteers are as untrue as they are unjust. Um, denying involvement in the rising and meeting the great suppressor of that rising and the government which led the suppression is more than a little at odds with later claims of central involvement. The rewriting of the history of 1916 was accompanied by the construction of the story that the GEA and the Catholic Church had always been at one. In independent Ireland, although the GEA sought to live up to its constitution regarding the pursuit of an Irish Ireland, it never sought to do the same for its commitment to non-sectarianism. There is no shortage of examples from here to choose. It's profoundly symbolic, however, that in the decades after independence, faith of our fathers was sung before uh, All-Ireland Finals and assorted bishops and archbishops were charged with starting matches by throwing in uh, the ball. Just, indeed, the sight of bishops' frocks flapping in the breeze as they laboured uh, towards the sidelines in a half trot to escape a game proceeding around them was almost cliched in mid 19th century Ireland. Against though, the real history is not of, of two things, institutions at one. It's much more mixed and much more interesting because of that. Although Archbishop Croke had supported the GA in its infancies, there were other bishops who wished for the GA to collapse. In the 1880s and 1890s, there were bishops and priests who called on the GA to disband and pressurized their members to leave. They were concerned about several things. The first is the involvement of members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood in the upper reaches of the GEA and their efforts to recruit for revolution from its ranks. 
The second, and this will be familiar to some of you, is clerical opposition to the amount of drinking and disorder around GEA matches and the lingering suspicion that GEA men were skipping mass to play matches. These were concerns which have survived into the 21st century. Um, by the way, you'll notice that I've said men here and men, men, men all the time. There is only one woman mentioned in the GEA minute books before 1971 and that's Maud Gunn. It is a simple fact that no woman played Gaelic football in Croke Park before men walked on the moon. It is also a fact that it is um, 1903 when the Camogie Association had its first practice, but it was deemed not possible to game, call the game hurling because it would be injurious to the manliness of the Irish male to have women playing the same game during these periods. All of this is, is clear from the record books. So I am talking about men, not because I'm a chauvinist just because that's what the GA is about. Um, after 1921, however, nationalism, Catholicism and the GA were bound together as one. I'll give you an example. On the 25th of November 1940, a hurling match was played in Croke Park and was preceded by a commemoration of Bloody Sunday. The players of both teams knelt on the ground in front of Hill 16 as the tricolour flew behind the hill, was dipped in salute, and a decade of the rosary was recited by the players before they played the match. It was, the Irish press noted, in memory of the day when the black and tans machine gunned the crowd at Croke Park, the day when the Tipperary captain, Michael Hogan, lay bleeding to death on the ground in front of the hill. And Croke Park itself, from then, was seen as a shrine to Nationalist Ireland. In the same year, 1966, that the man in the pub told Raymond Smith about his imagined long past job ferrying the, ru the rubble of the rising along Jones's Road, the GEA staged a pageant in Croke Park, which some of you may remember, um, as its contribution to 50th anniversary of the 1916 rising was called Shocked or Far, Shocked Law, and it was written by the brilliant Brian McMahon. And it ended with a kind of reworking of the seven executed signatories of the 1916 proclamation facing a British army firing squad. Nobody doubted by 1966 that Croke Park and the Hill was the appropriate place for such a performance and that the GA was appropriate hosts. To conclude, um, the myth of Hill 16 lives on. It can be found on websites, on blogs, and t-shirts. Until a decade ago, it could be heard as part of the GEA tour, but I commend the GEA committee for changing that, and it's not now done, although um, there was, there's, Darrell Breen used to do the commentary on the walking tour, and he used to say that, he used to tell that story as part of the walking tour, that, um, uh, that it was built in the rubble of the 1916 rising, which is kind of apt that it was a comedian who was, uh, who was, who was, who was telling that story. It can still be found in GA, various GA books. And the myth has fed, spread further, far beyond the confines of sport, out into the wider Irish historiography. It has been fitted, slightly remoulded, into other histories. For example, Egon O'Rahilly, Egon O'Rahilly, in his 1991 book, Winding the Clock, The O'Rahilly and the 1916 Rising, wrote that the O'Rahilly, the O'Rahilly is one of the leaders of the 1916 Rising. Um, and his car, which was such a vivid part of Easter week 1916, as he first drove around the country on Easter Monday and Easter Tuesday, trying to stop the Rising, because he believed it had no chance of success, came back and joined them in the GPO, leaving his car outside where it was destroyed under the rubble of the GPO. And Aegon O'Rahilly writes in the book of his ancestor that the car was now probably buried under Hill 16 in Croke Park with the rest of the rubble from the burnt out buildings. More recently, during the visit of Queen Elizabeth II to Croke Park in 2011, the myth of Hill 16 was referenced on numerous occasions by journalists and even by some among the small army of historians whose spending power was greatly enhanced by the cottage industry fostered by media coverage of that visit. It's fair to ask, by way of brief conclusion, does any of this really matter? 
Does it matter that a sports organisation should invent a story? Does it matter that William Webb Ellis did not invent rugby? Does it matter that there is no rubble from the GPO under um, Hill 16? I believe it does matter. I do believe it matters because the myth matters in what it reveals and in what it conceals. In the decades after independence, its allure was obvious. And the, matters, the, the myth still matters now because the manner in which its endurance is a tribute to the appeal of a simplified past, a cartoon history which is constructed as against one that is diverse and complex and contradictory and I would argue is much more interesting because of that. And it matters also still to those of us who are members of the GEA because our own constitution retains as its basic aim and this might come as a shock to some GAA members, its basic aim is the strengthening of a national identity in a 32-county Ireland through the preservation and promotion of Gaelic games and pastimes. And it matters finally because within the spectrum of GAA members, it is considered useful to have a soft patriotism that almost all can accept. Um, I'll answer any questions if, if anybody wants any questions.